about that. Oh. All of a sudden, the sound went out here. Uh, I'm laughing because you you say you're very lucky, and, and I appreciate your humility. And though you've got to be pretty epic to win four national, uh, seven national, and and uh, four world titles. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Thank you. I, and uh, you, as I mentioned, you had quite a pedigree. You have a very legendary father. Tell us about yes, I former do. Hall of Fame heavyweight boxing champion Jack Mott. Yes, uh, my father Jack Mott. 60s. He was a world professional champion boxer, uh, undefeated. He retired uh, to join the Navy and serve during Vietnam. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Amazing man. I want to talk a little bit more. To. Yeah, I want to share a little bit more about that as we go on. You have anybody special listening to the show today? Uh, my family is listening out of uh, North Carolina and New York. Uh, of course, Roswell Barbell. Roswell Barbell. Callahan, Anna, the whole team. Yes. And uh, back in Buffalo, New York, the uh, my original team, the Steel Dogs, my family. Steel Dogs. I love it. Welcome, everyone. For those of you listening on WDJY FM 99.1 right here in Atlanta, we give a shout out to you, to our friends, as you mentioned, at Roswell Barbell in particular. Let's tell them about it. Don't touch that dial. Turn up the volume, guys. We have an amazing show in store for you today. Yep. Thank you for being here. So let's jump right into the questions. I have so many. You're, sure. you're, you know, I know you're, one of the things I really love about you is you're, you're a man who, you live by a code. You're such an honorable man. You live with integrity. You live with honor. You live with dignity and humility. And I have worked with a lot of really high-level athletes, as you know. Right. And it's always so refreshing and such a privilege to be with somebody who's so accomplished and so humble. Thank so thank you. thank you for that. It's really, really that's, a pleasure. That's very nice of you. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. So take me back to the beginning. I want to hear – I love to hear the story about where somebody has – has come from, how sure. they arrived at where they are today. And you have a fascinating story. Well, Tell us about your your roots, so sure. to speak. The, the, and, the, and the humblism is straight from my family. My father raised me to be the same way that he was raised and brought up. We don't gloat, you know, gloat about ourselves or anything. Right. We're very humble. I'll be the first person to make fun of myself or tease myself to anybody else. People look at me, and uh, I'm sure with, same with you. We're big people. Yep. We're gym people. We're athletes, and they immediately start thinking a certain way about us. Right. That we must be egotistical, that we must be kind of that jerk persona. Yeah. And in reality, I'm a very humble and reaching out type of person that tries to help, you know, people around me or anything. But that's that's how I was brought up. You know, uh, my father made very sure from a child that um, <clears throat> you don't get bullied, but you are always compassionate towards right. everybody else. Um, and it, it started at, I, I want to say, around four four years old, five years old, uh, my father started putting me into, like, little peewee wrestling camps, things like that. <laughs> at four or five. Oh, I yes. Love it. My, my, uh, I love it. My dad was, again, he was he was a man's man. My right. dad is 79 years old right now. He lives in Casanova in a wooded land. 79 years old. He is still 200-plus pounds in shape chops down trees every day, you know, wheels them around a wheelbarrow. He is a man's man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you still don't want to get hit by him, exactly. I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah, nearly but, uh, 80. But my father, uh, <clears throat> I was um, sparring with him. I uh, started doing boxing at a young age. I uh, was doing wrestling. Um, I went from collegiate throughout all of my schooling, elementary, you know, junior high, high school. I uh, wound up uh, with a partial scholarship to Cobble Skill outside of Albany, New York. <clears throat> uh, wrestling through there. Um, I was boxing. I was being trained out of Casanova Chittenango Way. Um, and my father, of course, was the main person coaching me. Of I mean, we had, we had people at the uh, rings out there that were working with me. But uh, um, it was mainly, like, uh, and I was telling before, like Rocky Marciano was, right. you know, um, nicest, amazing people. And it's amazing how, how you say people that have been through things who have truly accomplished things are usually some of the more humbling That's right. and outgoing people yeah. um and i was so lucky to be raised in that type of environment um i was doing boxing uh as well as wrestling i was boxing golden gloves from the time i was 15 16 17 years old sure um i gave that up a bit when i went to college because there was no place for me to really train right um i focused more on my wrestling um <clears throat> From there, I actually moved, I lived with my soon-to-be tag team partner. Yes. He was a wrestler, too, and uh, we were both pretty good. <laughs> and uh, we uh, 
he lived in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is just outside of New York City. And uh, he one day tells me, and we would love to watch wrestling. We'd watch Raw, we'd watch ECW, and it was great. We'd watch it in our dorm rooms and, uh, you know, do little promos pretending we're, you exactly. know, people. And uh, he tells me one day, hey, these people that uh, they are in ECW, Tony DeVito, um, Just Incredible, Jeff Liable, Mike Bell, he's like, they, uh, they have a school right by where I live. And he met them. Right. And, you know, we're joking around at first. I'm like, well, we got to go. I'm like, there's no doubt about this. <laughs> we're going we're to go down. And right. We're, and we're thinking, we're too, you know, we're college, you know, athlete. We're, you know, we, we, we're totally going to smoke this. This is going to be great. And they beat the living heck out of us for four hours. Wow. I got a concussion from Tony DeVito. And all I could think of was, I so can't wait to come back. back. Like, right. This, this right. is what I want to do. Wow. <laughs> Wow, interesting. So I want to ask you a little bit more about your father because sure. not, not everybody grows up with a legend as a father. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, you were really, really blessed to do so. What was it like to grow up, uh, particularly as a little kid? I mean, I'm sure there came a time well, when you grew up and you you had your own accolades that spoke for themselves. But what was it like to be a little kid growing up, starting to wrestle, starting to box, starting to grapple? under the shadow of somebody who became a Hall of Fame heavyweight boxing champion of the world. What was that like? My father casts a very big shadow. And <clears throat> I, I find it amazing that children of athletes or children of people who have accomplished a great deal in life right. can either go one of two ways, I've seen. They either follow in the footsteps towards something of themselves or they tend to kind of regret their parents or how successful they were because of that shadow um i like to think the way that my father instilled my values and my mother as well sure um i i truly think that that's what made me the man that i am um there was never a time where i ever was like i don't want to be this type of person I could always remember from, you know, looking at any step in my life and thinking that's the type of man I want to be when I grow up, you know, to that's the type of hopefully father I want to be when I grow right. up. Sure. Everybody respected my father um, whenever I went anywhere from when, <clears throat> uh, and I know it's something we spoke about before, right. when the Boxing Hall of Fame opened in Chittenango, New York, my father brought me and it was amazing to meet and and again i'm in fourth grade it's the amount of people and the atmosphere it's i wouldn't know you know i only knew a quarter of like if i was adult of and course. saw that type sure. of and saw these people you know the, these legends um you know all together right and I mean, how often do you see every living you know champion of an era together at one place yeah that may have been the only time that you'll ever see that right i mean um for me growing up i love well, besides my father right <laughs> um sugar ray robinson sugar ray leonard you know holyfield all these people and they were all there right? oh yes the only person that wasn't there was mike tyson <coughs> because he was in training for his fight that month and he couldn't make it um right to new york but watching my my father and everything that he did, you know, and <clears throat> my father was a, um, he was a military man. He was a fighter, you know, there was very regimented, you know, and that's how I grew up. There's a place for, you know, a thing and everything has a place, right? You know, there's a timing of everything you do. And, and, uh, um, I, I, I loved it. I mean, I don't, I don't understand how I could have ever thought of coming in a different way in life, Yeah, you know, but he was, he was a generous very generous person well, he is a very generous person he is a very caring person he uh personifies the heart on the sleeve yeah in everything he does whether it's you know a caring helping hand but at the same point you know don't try to run a game on him or don't try to cross <laughs> yeah, him. yeah don't try to cross him right? i had a uh when I, I he had me take uh taekwondo as a child i got a black belt by the time i was 12. now let's be honest me being 12 years old, I'm yeah. not going to beat up an adult. No. But I got a black belt somehow. My uh, trainer, uh, Mr. White, 
knew who my father was. I mean, everybody around my father knew who my father of was. Course. He would always joke around about wanting to fight my father just to see if a Taekwondo black belt or degree, whatever he was, could beat a boxing. undefeated yeah. boxing champion. Right. One day in a, an event, <clears throat> he decided to snap a kick by my father's head. My father knocked him out instantaneously with one punch and stood over him and said, don't you ever do this again. Yeah. And then took me right out of there, and that was the last time I did karate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Interesting. I, did any of your siblings compete in athletics? Um, my my brother was a, more of a musician. Okay. He was very talented. He actually uh, he was lead uh, guitarist for a band Below Zero. Uh, they opened around the world for Megadeth and Metallica, right. things like that. Wow. And, um, yep. <clears throat> he's amazing. Um, he still is to this day. Everything he does is, I, he's a very uh, musical, but he, he works in designs. He actually designs a lot of systems for Apple now. Um, it went from uh, working at his own, he built his own studio, and from there he kind of took that whole side. Right, so. right. So he took the same kind of discipline, the same kind of focus, the same basic uh, wiring, if you will, that your mom and dad provided <coughs> with him, and then he became highly successful in another venue, if you will. Yes. And you have a sister, as I recall, right? I have two sisters. Two sisters, yep. excuse me. Okay. Yep. Um, my one, uh, one was uh, an uh, like lacrosse, things like that. Yep. She was an athlete on her own will. Uh, my other, um, she uh, wasn't really an athlete or anything, but I will say this. My little sister is amazing. She battled cancer. Wow. They had to remove over a third of her shoulder. Wow. She came back. She can't lift her arm over a certain way. She will never let somebody help her because right. she is too proud. She did an Ironman uh, triathlon wow. and completed it. It's funny, Jeff. We all have our epic battles. Yes. And, and it's, it's, having had cancer myself, I know what a battle that is. Yeah, and, and so. I told her, you know, watching her go through the chemo, watching her go through everything that she did, watching when she came out of those surgeries and not knowing if she would ever have functionality out of her arm. Yeah. So what she, <clears throat> the mobility that she got, then to doing what she did, she's truly a hero to me. Right. You know. Yeah. I mean, she always looks at me as her big protective brother. Of course. But I'm like, no, you're, you know. A force all to herself, unto herself. Exactly. Yeah. Tell me about your mom. My mom's a very amazing woman. Um, I mean, to put up with myself and my brother and uh, my <laughs> sister, she has to be. Uh, she, um, she was always there for us. You know, um, my parents uh, both love me. You know, um, like many, they got divorced at an age and everything. But mm -hmm. what I respect is they never took it out or did anything around me. They both always made each other look good to my eyes. Beautiful. Um, which I think is so important to a child in days is, right. I, I never understood why anybody would ever do dirty to, no. a, par a, 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 to a parent right. in front of a child. No. You know, your parents should always be, in a way, perfect, you know, for you to think of as to, you know, hopefully base your life on right. and your future on. And uh, they did that no matter what. You know, and yeah. they, throughout my high school years, even in my college, they did that. And as a result, they ended up with four very stable, remarkable young people. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> to parents. So tell me this. As you started to compete, at some point, the gear shifted, and you decided to make that proclamation to yourself that you wanted to become somebody. Jeff, how old were you when that happened that you decided, and I don't know what it was, you know, was it that you want to become a state champion, a national champion, a world champion? When did that hit you? I, I think <clears throat> somewhat young. I mean, when I got into boxing and when I got into wrestling, right? I just loved to compete. I, I didn't, it didn't, it wasn't about being, well, when I got into wrestling, then it was, you know, more about I wanted, I'm not going to lie, I wanted people to chant my name. I wanted yes. to hear my music. I wanted to see my screen, entrance screen. I wanted to, you know, but it's deeper than that. I want to compete. Yeah. Well, you're I wired want, for it. You're, yeah. You came I, into I, this I, world even, as a warrior. Even to this date, you know, I, I, I do powerlifting now, everything. I have to compete. And it's not just to go against somebody, but... Like you said, it's wired into me. I have yeah. to, I have to stand toe to toe with somebody. I have to, 
Um, I, I'm not ready to just sit down and, you know, spend my nights on a couch or, you know, watch the, you know, paint dry or anything. I, I want to make the most out of the opportunities that I have in the direction that I'm going, no matter which way that is. I love it. So one of the things, once again, and I mentioned this early on in the interview, is you walk with such humility and yet you're, you're a lion. How do you, how do you make that work? Jeff, how how are you so kind, so generous? Uh, you I'm walk with so much humility, and, and and you know when you get in the ring, when you get on the platform, you, you know the the lion comes out. How do you you do that so gracefully? I, that's so seamless in your life. Thank you. I mean, that's coming from you. It's it, it really means a lot. It really does. I don't just represent myself. From a young age, my father sat me down, and my mother sat me down, and they implanted into me and it, and it's kind of funny because through the years every person that's trained me has kind of said something similar you don't ever represent yourself right every step you take along life it's you're representing your parents you're representing your family anybody that's ever had a contact into you you know <clears throat> you're representing from the time I moved to Buffalo and I was lucky enough when I made my transition from wrestling into powerlifting I met my family the steel dogs Every time I competed or did anything, I wasn't representing myself. Yeah. I wasn't just representing my family now. I'm representing the 15, 16 other people that are on my team that we consider a, as a family. When I moved out to here, and I was so lucky enough to meet Roswell Barbell, or go to Roswell Barbell, right. and meet Callahan, and meet Anna, and meet all the other lifters you know, that are there, uh, guys and girls, they're just, they're just amazing. And, and, the, and how much they care. Right. Anything I do. It, it reflects to them. Yeah. So Absolutely. in reality, they're all on my shoulder. So everything I do in life, if I if I ever act like a jerk, I'm putting that shadow onto them. Right. If I <clears throat> ever am not humble or if I ever do something wrong, I'm giving a black eye to every single person that's ever helped me. And I can never let that happen. You know, it means too much to me and the way that I was grown and brought up to ever disrespect you know so you live as a as a warrior with a code <laughs> I, yeah, I guess you could say that yeah. yeah I mean that's a very very noble path not a lot of people will do that I mean today I watch a lot of athletes and as you know I've been uh, in some positions to work on some very very high-level athletes and some are extraordinary uh, both uh, whether it be on the platform on the track on the field and some not so much no and I know. Uh, it's it's just so refreshing to have somebody who is is really balanced and is using whatever it is in this case you're wrestling you're power lifting you're grappling yeah. uh, as a way to express yourself competitively in the world and to have that out as an outlet but but also in a noble way that leaves people inspired to to live a, a higher life higher path great thank no yeah. that means a lot thank you yeah of thank course you. of course Tell us what it was like to to have the exposure to some of the legends in the wrestling world that you wrestled or that trained you. It, it was, in, in <clears throat> the best way I can think about it is I grew up watching wrestling. Right. Just like boxing and everything else. These people, I started meeting them in my life in my late teens to 20s where I could realize and rationalize like I'm meeting this person. You know, I'm, yes. I'm meeting this person that was right. on television, you know, or somebody that I was a huge fan of. And uh, it was, I mean, in a way, very humbling. Um, I mean, if you want to, I don't anybody think anybody could say that they didn't have, wouldn't have butterflies in their stomach 24-7. Right. Every time, you know, of meeting someone. And then getting to know a lot of them um, and just being lucky enough to be, like, friends with them. You know, and I mean actual friends where you're going and doing things and you're you know <clears throat> talking about life outside or you know calling each other you know little little things like that it's uh it, it's amazing to even contemplate and think about like you know uh, in a situation and um one of them i think the the greatest one is when we decided we were gonna retire and we figured we kind of did everything in the business that we wanted to do through wrestling right we wrestled uh, the Outsiders, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Home, oh, right. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were two of the wrestlers growing up that my partner and I were, like, inspired 
and what we almost kind of built our characters around. I was a huge Scott Hall fan. I loved Razor Ramon. <clears throat> that was like, I mean, he was uh, an Italian guy or a part, uh, part Italian, part Native American who played a Cuban. I'm an Italian who played a Puerto Rican on television. You know, <laughs> uh, my partner loved Big Daddy Cool Kev, uh, Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash, right. And so it was kind of funny because we're wrestling, you know, at that point, and we're doing small independence, and we see them tag. And I grabbed onto my partner, and I said to him, this is what we need to do. I'm like, we need to tag. We need to get together. I'm like, if they did it, look up, we're going to be huge. We can do this. And right. he, he fought me for two years on this. I'm like, ah, oh, we're going to do singles. You know, we're really good singles. I'm like, I'm like, no, we could, you know, and we did. And we clicked, and it worked. And we worked. We're so lucky to work with so many people. We worked with the Dudley Boys, um, <clears throat> CM Punk and Cole Cabana. Um, I mean, you know, from old school, like Sergeant Slaughter, you know, to – you know, most people like AJ Styles and, and everybody, you know, that are current people in the WWE right. now, you know, people that were in awe and, and legendary. But we were so lucky enough that when we were going to be, we're like, well, this is going to be the last, you know, hurrah. And we went down and we did it in New York City and, you know, in front of a, <clears throat> a giant stadium, a couple thousand, like 10,000 people. Wow. And we got to wrestle it's Kevin Nash and Scott Hall as our final match and uh, i mean when you really think about it going into something professional that was really just a dream and getting to end it with the people that inspired you to just do that dream yeah another you, dream you can't you can't, you can't really answer that yeah wow that's fantastic <clears throat> i love it what jeff what other people i i know your your father was legendary for not only what he did and what he accomplished but in his influence over you who else did so who were some of the other key people in your life that made a really big difference? For you know, it's it, it, through the years. Um, of course, Jeff Liable, uh, who took me under his wing uh, for wrestling. Tony DeVito, Mike Bell, um, legendary brother to Mark Bell of uh, Strong um, and Slingshot. <laughs> the Bell Brothers. Yes. Um, I still, to this day, will always have a tribute to him. Um, and still on my th on my wall and everything I have, I'd rather be dead than average um, with his name because that was always on the back of his shirts and everything else. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough that was my family. Right. Um, going into, of course, well, like you said, my father from the beginning. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a stronger, more inspirational person to follow my footsteps in. Um, we had uh, Jay Russell out of Albany who started me into grappling and MMA, really focusing, switching my styles, um, and going into, uh, <clears throat> I, I just went from a wrestler who was a, you know, attack, attack, go forward, attack. Right. To, well, you were classically trained. Right. To learning jiu-jitsu. And again, like what my father taught me was fighting isn't toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Fighting isn't just face-to-face -face saying, I'm going to hit you and you're going to hit me. Wrestling isn't just, I'm going to try to grab you and throw you. It's chess. It's, I love it. I'm going to do three to four moves ahead and put you where I want to put you for the end. Right. And um, I think it kind of went really full circle with Jay Russell to really wrap that around into me. Um, from there, um, <clears throat> more going back to when I decided after I had my second knee replacement um, and that I couldn't do MMA anymore. Um, I went, I still grappled and they helped me along through that and they supported me and uh, helped rehab me throughout that. Um, then I moved out to Buffalo and I was meeting with <coughs> uh, the, the people from the Steel Dogs and uh, the original people that brought me in from there. And they, when I was looking to see what's the next chapter in my life and they were out of nowhere, it just came and presented and right. you know i went to an old school gym the steel mill gym and uh because throughout my whole life I, I i've always tried to work out i've always tried to stay in shape i've always tried to be an athlete no matter what um they kind of looked at me and they're like you're strong and i'm like well you know they're like are you a bodybuilder i'm like no I'm <laughs> right I'm like, I'm an athlete. I'm not a bodybuilder. And I'm not saying... Yeah, no, no. I, I know. I, should, I have so I many bodybuldler like friends. Right. Yeah, I have so many bodybuilder friends, yeah, yeah. and I have nothing but respect for yes. them. But 
I always said, well, you know, I, I was a professional athlete. I, I did MMA, I grappled professionally, and I, I wrestled professionally. I'm very lucky to say that I did three different sports as a professional. And um, they're like, what have you ever thought about powerlifting? And I'm, I, I don't know, you know. And I, so that's the new horizon. Exactly. So, so what, let, me, let me ask you this. It sometimes can be tragic. For example, I, I broke my back in multiple places in a bad injury when I was about 22 years of age, and it ended my career when I was ranked very highly in the country for lifting. How old were you when you injured your knee, and what was the outcome of that? You know, you couldn't, you couldn't fight anymore. But you were, what, what age do you think? I was going into my 30s. Okay. I still tried. Like, I, I was lucky I was able to still wrestle, but I couldn't do a lot of things that I did before. I had to... I was in a fight. Um, I was up on points. I was up on rounds. It was the final round. I got a little bit too cocky. This guy was every time projecting that he would not try to go for this throw. I'd go behind him and I would German him. And <clears throat> I decided to do it again. He played it to know that I was going to do it. He planted and he turned, unfortunately. I had all of my weight and his weight on my left foot. Wow. As we both went into the air, my foot stayed, and then I landed and he landed on top of me, and then you just heard 12 pops. And, mm. uh, so my, you pretty much destroyed your left knee. Well, the sad thing is, is my uh, trainer, my sports doctor, everybody was there, and I'm begging them to just wrap up my knee and let me finish because I knew I could hold the guy and win. The competitive man. And they would not let it in New York State. They yeah. said that once, you know, so I had to, that was the first fight I lost in MMA, and it was wow. my last fight. Oh, my goodness. I am <laughs> so, so I, sorry. So I, I ended at 14-1 uh, in wow. MMA. Wow, 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 wow. On so. that note, we're going to take a, a break here, sure. and we're going to come back. Ladies and gentlemen, don't change that dial. I have the legendary former heavyweight world wrestling champion known as Oman Tortuga. This is Health Matters. I'm Dr. Nelson Bullmash. We'll be right back. Awesome. Is it good, sir? Very good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If I ramble, let me know, because no, I know I, no, I, no, I no. tend to ramble. Well, perfect. <laughs> no, ramble's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you want... People want to hear this kind of stuff. It's great. Okay. It's absolutely great. Anything you want to add in? Anything you want me to ask you? Um, maybe at some point about the, um, my back, um, getting into, um, uh, thank you. Um, like I was saying before, taking care of your body, things like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. going into, okay. you know, uh, stuff like that. But I mean, if we get to it, if we don't, oh, we will, no we're, we got 30 minutes left. We're halfway through. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're doing great. <laughs> we moved a lot faster than I thought we were. Ten okay, That's we're going to talk about coming back from your knee injury. Sure. Dr. Nelson Blumesh here once again with Health Matters. My guest today is former professional wrestling heavyweight world champion, Jeff Mott, formerly known as Oman Tortuga. Jeff, we were talking a moment ago about your devastating knee injury that actually took you out. You, unfortunately, was your last MMA competition and you destroyed your left knee, mm -hmm. uh, ending your career with one loss. What did you do? Did you blow out, blow out all the tendons and ligaments of the knee? Is that essentially what happened? I had to have my ACL, my MCL, my meniscus replaced. I've had pins put in to bring everything else back into shape. Wow. And unfortunately, it was not the first time I've had my ACL replaced. Yeah. So <clears throat> with the amount of scar tissue and everything in my leg, they, uh, my doctors at that time were even saying, you'll be lucky if you can do 80% of what you did from before. That's um, a pretty devastating, potentially a devastating injury. I like to think I bounced back pretty well. Um, I, like I said, I, I still wrestled. I had to put a bigger brace on my knee. Right. Um, I was able to finish more to what I wanted to do. Um, we still did several tours around the United States and Canada uh, at that point. Um, but it, it, it did take a lot out of it. And um, from there, I uh, um, had to kind of make a decision you know, of what I was going to do with the rest of, you know, am I still going to compete? How am I going to compete? And what's going to happen with it type of situation? You know? Sure. Let's, 
let's redirect for a second here and let's talk about what happened to you, not so much physically, but what happened to the man? What happened to your heart? What happened to your spirit after you had this severe, this devastating left knee injury? It, uh, <clears throat> it was, it was bothersome for a while. Like, I mean, it really, it really messed with me. Um, I'm not going to lie. Being somebody that you're, you know, feel like you can do anything, you know, that if you wanted to, you could walk through a wall, um, that you're a competitor, that, you know, that's what you're kind of known for. And especially in, in the type of sports that I did, uh, whether it was, you know, MMA, whether it was boxing, whether it was wrestling, whether it was grappling, people knew me when I was there. And the scariest thing is not being there right. because it's only, you know, a blink of an eye that you miss some time and everybody knows somebody else's name and you have to refight to regain any of that type of ground that you might have had from before and uh i think that was kind of the scariest thing and really not knowing and i and i always stayed confident like i've always had doctors tell me you know here or there like oh you can do this or you'll never be able to do this or right. whatever i know my body you know, I, I know what I'm capable of. I know what I can bounce back from, just like I'm sure, you know, through you and your past sure. and everything. <clears throat> I I know what I can come back from to a certain point. But at that point, it was a little bit of, am I going to be able to do this again? Yeah, you know, I can imagine. Or, or what am I going to be able to do? Or, right. You know, um, I, you know, it wasn't just, you know, MMA. It was, what if I can't? do any of it anymore what if i can't grapple anymore what if i can't you know uh, wrestle anymore what if i can't even little things at the at the time i was married and uh, i had, had a stepson who looked up to me i mean he traveled with me everywhere um he went in the rings and played when i was in wrestling he followed me to events um he slightly trained as a child when i was training you know even to this day he's 21 years old now i talk to him every week and he trains and does and follows the regimes that I taught him. Right. And but then I was like, what if I'm not going to be able to do things that I wanted to do with him? Sure. You know, type sure. of thing. And it just it just hits you. But at the same point, it makes you stronger because well, you have to look at it as: Are you going to give up? Yeah. And roll on your you know and show right. your belly, or are you going to fight? And are you going to tooth and nail and scratch and drag yourself back up? And that has always been. The way I was taught, no matter what, I'm going to pick myself up, I'm going to dust off my face, put everything on my shoulders, and I'm going to walk forward. Right. Yeah, it, it forces you, it compels you to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Uh, because what happens is uh, is that it, it, who you are and what you do is invisible. It right. just is who you are. Yeah. And so when it's taken from you, suddenly you lose the sense of, who am I? Right. right. Who am I and, and what, what am I going to do now? Because everything about who I am expressed as self in the world was that person. Exactly. And so you're no longer that person again. You become someone else. Right. Yeah. I, I didn't know if I could redefine myself. Yeah, I'll bet. You know? Well, that's a, when you destroy all those ligaments and you're somebody like a wrestler where you pick up people, you throw them down. I mean, that's, yeah. I can imagine you thought once or twice about whether that knee was going to hold up. Exactly. Oh, more than, more than that. Um, it's amazing when I got the ring, didn't think about it, yeah. but it was like hold before. Yes. <laughs> Are you going to hold? Is it exactly. bubblegum going to keep exactly. it all together? Do I have it wrapped up enough? Do I do, I, do I need another brace? Does, can I get something else on here? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> was there anybody in particular that really helped you transition from that injury back to the, the man that you are today? <clears throat> um, my parents. Um, my, my father really was there to talk about it. My mother, of course. Um, at that point, that's when I was... Uh, under Jay Russell's tutelage on things, and uh, he was there. Uh, he was there at the hospital. He was always stopping by the house to make sure how I was. Sure. Um, uh, he would ask me and invite me to go to uh, the studio and train people and talk to them and tell them how to move. I couldn't, but I could give knowledge. And, uh, you know, and, and one of the, it was nice to him to say, and it, it was true. As long as if you're teaching somebody, you're not losing what you learned right. or what you know. Right. Even if you can't do it at that moment. And he was right, you know, because I was able to come back. I couldn't, I, I still to this day, I, I could not block a kick with my left leg mm -hmm. um, for fear of having my, you know, tendons or anything. And, and in reality, even powerlifting, it, it's really played a factor with me where sure. I've been scared to 
uh, squat in the past, prof- you know, for competition. Yeah, I got Because it. I wouldn't know how much that knee could really, really handle. Hold. Yeah, I got you know, it. And I've gotten, I've gotten over that um, thanks to really <clears throat> my family, the Steel Lugs, and more recently really and pushed it from Callahan. And uh, even thanks with you, yes. with everything that you've done for me. Right. Um, it's really, between the two of you guys, have really installed a lot more confidence in me with going over form and really describing and showing me how, you know, I'm going to be able to do this. Right. Well, you take uh, amazing care of yourself now. And I don't know if you did before your injury, but you're a wise man and a very wise athlete in that you... You take a lot of time for prep, and you take a lot of time for taking care of yourself. So it's not a, a luck thing with you. It is that you prepare yourself to be the warrior on the mat or on the stage of lifting, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Tell us about that. <clears throat> well, I wish I learned about it a lot earlier in life. Don't we all? <laughs> and I, I try to say this all the time, um, especially at the gym. Right. When I see all these young cubs, you know, in their teens and 20s and they're, you know, strong as as heck and they're lifting everything they can lift. And, you know, they think body maintenance is going to the gym six days a week. Yeah. And uh, I just sit there and shake my head and I'm like, yep, I was like that. I was like that all the way into my 30s. Sure. And then injuries and surgeries. And like, I mean, I've had a lot of especially through wrestling and everything people don't think like we really get hurt i've had my shoulders torn out a couple times my ribs fractured my orbital bone broken i've had my nose broken you know uh my knee replaced it's uh it takes a lot of toll on your body and in your 20s you know i heal pretty quickly my 30s healing a little bit slower in my 40s it's like oh i'm gonna get up and i gotta i gotta will myself to get out of bed for a little bit yes (laughs) Yeah, I, but, uh, it's it's funny, Jeff. I, I have a joke that I share with my wife. I make sure that uh, either I get up before she's out of bed or I wait till she's out of bed if we wake up the same time because she likes to tease me. Oh, Dr. Bullmash, how old are you today, sweetheart? 90, yep. 92? Yep, yep. Be quiet, honey. Go back to bed. <laughs> but I, but I, um, it's about body maintenance now. Yeah. And it took me a long time to really get into it. Um, <clears throat> I would always stretch and do whatever but i didn't really understand what body maintenance was and i, and I have a regime and it's kind of funny my father like even my, my father's 79 years old now you know and i was talking to him about okay i'm getting ready to i'm gonna be flying out to houston texas for the ipl masters cup to compete and it's my first competition back since um being in the hospital and everything last august oh i did not know that and wow. um he you know he'll sit down well what's your regime well, what's your training? And I go through it well yeah. with him. Well, good. And, and I try to install it on the, on the kids. And I'm like, okay, well, who are you going to for a chiropractor? Who are you going to for your masseuse? Are you doing cryo? You know, all, all, all these things. How often? What's right. your schedule? And uh, in, in reality, <clears throat> it's, again, a thing from Callahan and from you, from right. being lucky enough to, whoever basically Callahan told me when I moved down here, because sure. I knew I had, a, I had a regime in Buffalo. I knew what doctors to go to. I knew what chiropractor to go to. I knew what chiro to go to. I knew what masseuse to go to. I knew when to go. I moved down here. I was like, I have nothing, <laughs> you know, <coughs> and I was still in healing. Right. And uh, luckily enough, I met Callahan and he told me, this is who I go to for masseuse. And I went to there. Little girl, 110 pounds. I'm used to having a masseuse who was this 275 pound big dude. And I'm like, all right, go as heavy, you know, as hard as you can on me. She beat the heck out of me. I had my head in that little pillow thingy. I'm like, I'm not crying no matter what you share. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, I like you. You know, you're, you're and, and every three weeks. I let her beat the heck out of me. Hundred you know? pounds of Wolverine. Exactly. I'm like, and I and like anybody that sees her, and I'm like, I just laugh when the new people come, and I'm like, oh, just wait, tell her to go as hard as she can. I'm like, trust me. And uh, then Callahan told me, well, this is who I go for a chiropractor. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, and and not to boost your you know your head or anything. You're a very humble person don't like worry, myself. I, but... I come from a Jewish mother. I, I don't think there's <laughs> anything you could say that would boost my ego. <laughs> I, I've I've had at least six or seven different chiropractors. Um, through my life right. that I would go through regularly. 
and none of them were close to what you, your knowledge and what you can kind. do. Thank you. Um, I was getting back injections every three months. Right. Um, after herniating and rupturing a disc. Wow. And I still competed through it. And wow. I still did everything through it because I was not ready to, you know, maybe stubbornly, maybe stupidly. I'm a man. It, we're, I, I'm, I'm just going to sit guilty. here and smile. Exactly. Right, that's we're guilty right, of right. that. But since coming down here, since going through my regime right. and having you work on me twice a week, I have never had another injection. Fantastic. I have never had the pains that I've had. Excellent. And I quote that to body maintenance. Yeah. Um, I do cryo every week, several t once or twice a week, no matter what. Tell people, Jeff, what that is. A lot of people don't. I know cryo's been out for about 20 years. Right. I think it started in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. But it's And it's gotten big in the United States yeah. within the last, I want to say, four or five years. Yeah, that's right. Cryology is a, basically you're putting yourself into a tube or a chamber. They fill it with uh, dry ice. Um, what is that called? Um, CO2? CO2? Yeah, I right. think it is, right? Right. It goes from whatever the temperature is outside to negative 250 degrees. Oh, it's liquid nitrogen, I think. Yes, yes. Excuse sorry, me. Sorry. Not, not, excuse me. It's liquid nitrogen. I'm not allowed. To, no, I'm, no, no, no. I'm, okay. I'm allowed to not know that because I get hit in the head off for 20 years. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're fine. <laughs> I, I had to think about but it at uh, a moment, but but it, yes. And oh, my God, that's very cold. Oh, no, it is. You put on, you put <laughs> wow. on little, little slippers and little gloves and put on your underwear, and then you stand in there for three minutes, and you turn every 30 seconds. But what it does is it, it, you come out freezing, but phenomenal uh injuries knees uh tears that you have inflammation that you have right because it rushes and increases almost five times your white blood cell count it's kind of like when we were athletes back in the day and we would do the ice bath for 15 20 minutes oh, yes times a thousand <laughs> right right and i was always the big believer in the ice bath i would after fights Go in an ice bath. I would, after you know, certain matches and sure. wrestling, and everything, I would be in an ice bath, you know. And uh, I right now, I go into that cryo every time after I do a major competition lift. So I'm practicing my deadlifts that night. I'm in the cryo. I do my squats that day on Saturdays. I'm in the cryo right after. Right. You know, I'm benching. I'm in the cryo. Uh, I don't take a chance. I feel amazing. I, I think I'm 41 years old. I'm still one in the one in one of the best shapes of my life. Right. Luckily, yeah. Thank, thank yes. God. Thank everything. Um, but I'm feeling so much less pain than I was in my 30s. Right. And uh, my mobility is much better. And I really thank it to body maintenance and taking the time of not just stretching, not just drinking your water, not just eating healthy, but doing what you have to to keep your body. We're, we're athletes. Right. Our job is to break our bodies as often as possible. Yes. Like when it really comes down to it, no matter what we're doing, whether sure. it's running, fighting, training, whatever, we're breaking our body. We're destroying our body. Body maintenance rebuilds our body to keep us being able to do this for as long as possible. And I try to tell the kids, you're 20. Do you want to be great 20 and not worry about 30 or 40? Or do you want to be great through your 40s and 50s and 60s? 60s, yes. You know, yeah. I, I, see, yeah. I see power lifters in their 70s at national competitions. Right. And I want to be that guy, you know. I've taken care of them. I can tell you they take really great care of themselves. Yep. So, Jeff, listen, we're going to take a moment. We'll sure. be right back, everyone. This is Dr. Nelson Bullmash. Once again, this is Health Matters, and I'm speaking to Oman Tortuga of the Outcast Killers. We'll be right back. Facebook is live if you guys want to say anything to Facebook. Oh, right. We're on Facebook Live still. But I can still hear you during the commercial. Jeff, you have any words you want to say to everybody on Facebook watching us on Facebook Live? Uh, we, I really appreciate you guys uh, taking time watching this, uh, supporting uh, Dr. Nelson and myself. I really appreciate it. It's very humbling, and thank you. Thank you for, for joining us, everyone. Stay right there, because we're going to be back momentarily. Let's go into your career. Yes. we got 14 minutes left, so. Sure.
Dr. Nelson Bullmash, thank you. We're back. I am interviewing Jeff Mott, formerly known as Oman Tortuga. Jeff, yes, sir. Us, I, I'm, I'm pausing for a moment because I don't <laughs> in any way want to embarrass you. But, no, no. But I have to ask you that funny story. Tell us about what your name means and, and what happened when you uh, went to some of the Latin American <laughs> countries to wrestle. So Oman Tortuga came from my partner. My partner is Puerto Rican. He's right. from Puerto Rico. Uh, grew up in Ponce, and uh, he and his family came out this way. I met him at college. We were both wrestlers. And we just happened to uh, dorm in the same room together, and we became really close friends and family. Um, when people would come home drunk, I don't drink, um, I would always jump in the hallway and tackle people and start wrestling them in the hallway. <laughs> some people thought it was really funny. Some people maybe not so much. Not so but much. Uh, my partner always thought it was hilarious, and he started calling me Oman Tortuga. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, well, what does that mean? Because I'm Italian and I don't know. <laughs> right. And uh, he's like, well, you know, it means, oh, my turtle, because, you know, you're my best friend. And I'm like, okay, mm. kind of weird, but cool. I'm, I'm going to go with it, you know, because <laughs> turtle has been my nickname since I was uh, 12 years old. Uh, tall and lanky. My, uh, at the time, my wrestling coach had bent my head over and stretched my neck out, and he'd smack me on the back of the head, so I looked like a turtle. I stayed ever since. <laughs> okay. And uh, so... I'm wrestling, years are going by, and I would tell everybody this story of what my name meant. And my partner always kind of sit there and just go along with it. And then we're finally, we're in Puerto Rico, and we're wrestling for IWL. And uh, I'm telling these people, like, oh, yeah, my name, this is how I got my name. And they're all looking at me really weird. And my partner's just sitting there in the corner, laughing hysterical. And I just look at him. I mean, he's pulling tears from his eyes. You know, he's thinking it's the greatest thing. And I'm like, what? He's like, dude, I got to tell you. He's like, I just let you go with us for years. He's like, Oman doesn't mean oh my. He's like, it's slang for evil. And I just sat there and I'm like, dude, that is so much cooler. Why didn't you tell me this from before? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes, the other side of that joke is in America and Japan and Canada, when they hear Oman Tortuga, they're like, oh, that's a really cool name. When you go to Mexico or Puerto Rico or anywhere that, you know, speak Spanish majorly, they look at you and you're supposed to be the heel, the bad guy, and they're like, dude, your name means Evil Turtle. Evil Turtle. You're, you're, yeah, you're not, we're not being scared of you. Hey, I'm playing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle card myself, yeah. but oh, yeah, it was, I don't know if I have that reference, but exactly. that's where I'd go with pretty it, much, I think. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> have you ever done any, any coaching of younger folks? Is um, that something you've done? Yes. Um, I, I was lucky enough, I helped um, coming in. Throughout the years, I always would go to friends' schools and take time to give back and go and train, give people a little bit of experience, uh, tell them not only with wrestling, but how the road works, how, you know, working with different promotions, anything that I could to help them out, working on their gimmick. Uh, working on their microphone skills, working on, you know, going over what is your persona, you know, anything I could to help out. Um, I, I would do that as much as possible. Um, I did the same thing through jiu-jitsu with Team Russell and going into uh, Buffalo. When I moved to Buffalo, I went and helped out with a uh, place called uh, Buffalo BJJ. And I would spend time uh, grappling and helping the younger people um, or the newer people uh, understand more and go right. through form more and everything else. And, uh, I mean, even with lifting, I'm not, <clears throat> I am not the world's greatest lifter. I am not the world's greatest. I mean, Callahan, if you were listening, you know, this, <laughs> my form from the time that I, you met me to now, they used to laugh at me and they're like, you look like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, meaning my arms were stuck in, right. in, a, in a curved position. Uh, like if people who know lifting, it looked like I wore a bench shirt 24 seven sure. um, because I was so unflexible and uh, working with them um, and taking the time and getting my form down. And, and sure. it's like, it's like that with everything. Yeah. Well, and then think about it. You're, you're the way you manage yourself in time and space is very, very differently as a wrestler yes. than it is as an Olympic lifter or a power lifter. Yep. The mechanics are, are very different. Yeah. And, and even through then I like to help out the best I can. Um, I look at what they've done for me, um, and not to keep you know bringing them up, but uh, it, it means a lot to me because I'm that type it. of person. Right. Uh, the amount that they do uh, there at that gym at Roswell Barbell, and 
that they look out for everybody. I mean, I've been to a lot of gyms. You've been to a lot of gyms. I've been to a lot of gyms. People pay three, four hundred dollars for that type of training on top of their gym memberships, yeah. and Callahan does it free. because they care. Yeah. So anything that I can do and to help out and work with other people, uh, it's you wouldn't even have to ask me. I, I would do it in a heartbeat. You know. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that you're plugging them because Roswell Barbell will be known certainly throughout the United States and maybe eventually worldwide. Hopefully. They, they have an amazing attitude. They come from love. They come from uh, family. Yep. And uh, they are um, incredible with what they do for the young people, at focusing them, teaching them discipline, teaching them respect. And they have a world-class facility, Jeff. Yeah. So and, and I expect great things to come from that from that gym. And if we have time, one, one little no, story please, that re do. relates right to that. Yeah. August, I um, retore um, a glute from a past injury from wrestling where I hit a post and ripped my glute right open. Wow. <clears throat> um, I was powerlifting. I was doing a competition in New York State for the New York State Push-Pull Championships off a beach. It was beautiful. Wanted to do it no matter what. And uh, I was protecting my back, did a different form, retore my glute, not even knowing I tore, I tore it. Wow. I saw a doctor, and they diagnosed me and immediately just looked at me and said, oh, it's just a fluid buildup. You'll be fine. It's inflammation. They gave me uh, a steroid pack, a pill set to mm. take for a week. Uh, I was infected. Uh, there was something sitting in my glute from before, from that past injury, that when it got opened up. And uh, I wound up collapsing and spending a week in the hospital wow. where I almost died. And so in other words, back. you had some kind of encapsulated maybe cyst or something, and then it began, you became something. cystic? Oh, it was, I went septic? full septic. Wow. Um, oh I, had, I had a size of a grapefruit on my hip, and it was dark purple. Um, they, for over a week, were draining me, doing procedures and everything. Wow. Then once they released me for a month and a half, I was having nurses come to my house to keep the wound open and keep continuing to drain me until they cleared me. Um, which they did finally in October, end of October of this past year. I, from there, uh, started trying to train again, doing light of whatever I could until I moved down here. Working with you, working with Roswell Barbell, made me confident enough to do um, this May 12th. I'm flying to Houston, Texas to compete in the IPL Masters Cup. Uh, which is the top of nationals for 40 and over. Right. It's more than anything that I could even say to myself for gratitude towards the people that have gotten me to where I am and comfortable, again, to be able to trust strength in my body and sure. really show me that, you know, like, like we talked about with my knee, this was something where... Not only was I, will I be able to compete again, but, you know, for a while was, am I going to be able to live? Am I going to be able to, right. you know, and I'm back to being lucky enough to be in one of the strongest uh, conditions in my life again, in the strongest shapes in my life. It's pretty remarkable, Jeff. And uh, where I feel confident enough to, you know, not only just do, but I'm doing full meat and everything else and completely had to retrain myself and trust in what Callahan and those guys were telling me, this is what you're going to do. And trust right. in when you would tell me, like, this yes. is what's going to happen. That's right. And, and that's my thing. We have ups and downs as people. You know, everybody is. So our roads are not easy. We don't, we don't become a champion from being easy. But there are times that we need to really test ourselves and trust the people around us that this is what the right way is going to be, and this is how you can bounce back from anything and come back stronger. I, you know, wise words, Jeff, and I appreciate that. I, I didn't know that you went through the, the, the devastating trauma that you did in October. I was unaware of that. It's interesting. A friend of mine who is the grandmaster of the Ninkagiru martial arts system, his name is Sabutai Musashi, sent me an email after my daughter won her second world lifting title. And I'll never forget this. Which is amazing, by the way. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, and I, I got to, as you know, I got to coach her. So not only was I 
there to watch, but I was actually there to watch my daughter win while I got to coach her. And mm-hmm. I got to be in the coach's box at the World Championships, which is one of the pinnacle moments of my life. But I'll never forget this. So we're catching our breath. We're staring at each other. And all of a sudden, my phone starts to vibrate. And I look at it. And it's from Sabutai Musashi. And he says in his text, champions are made when no one is looking. Yep. It's true. <laughs> It's it's that, you know, every time it's a road. Yeah. So you get to see the, the brilliant performers on the stage or in the arena, but very, very few people get to see what it looks like to get there. Exactly. So, <clears throat> Jeff, I end my show this way. I have something called Final Thoughts. What are your final thoughts today? Well, I, I hope in a way, without sounding, you know, in, in any type, that hearing the path that I've done is inspirational to some people and more than that being humble no matter what in life no matter what you become you always got to stay humble because there will always be somebody more successful there will always be somebody bigger there will always be somebody stronger but you need to use that to learn you need to learn use that to make yourself better um, there's not just one path there's multiple and taking and constantly coming back is what makes a champion a champion. Wise words. Thank you, my friend. It's been a privilege, and I hope you'll join us again. Definitely. Thank you. I want to end with this. My next guest in two weeks on May 1st, Tuesday at 5 p.m. will be another legend. Her name is Dr. Lori Shemek. This is her book here, folks. How to Fight Fat Flammation. Check it out. Read it. I'm going to give you a quiz in two weeks when Dr. Lori Shemek is on the TV behind the camera. We're going to have another great Health Matters episode. Join us then. Once again, May 1st, Tuesday, 5 p.m. Dr. Nelson Bullmash, this is Health Matters, signing out. Have a wonderful evening, and thank you for joining us.